you're looking for that essence. You just want to kind of grab that essence of, right, okay, I get what this show is. Uh, that, that's the thing. And, and that can be done in a kind of few paragraphs or just a page, you know. The be I mean, the best pitches, and there's a real knack to them, and I know it's incredibly difficult, and no one likes writing these documents. Uh, you're, you're bloody weird if you enjoy doing those. Uh, everybody sort of hates it. Uh, but the best ones explain what the idea is, uh, who it's about, and also somehow capture a bit of the voice and the attitude of the comedy within that document. It's Screen Skills. Welcome to our free online event. Um, we're delighted you're all joining us today for this Lunch with a Commissioner session with Gregor Sharp, who's the commissioning editor for comedy at the BBC. And the chair of the session is Emily Allen, development producer, also at the BBC. Um, so, Emily, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you. Gregor, hi. Hello. How are you? Hello. It's nice to see you. Not in the same place, but it's nice to see you. Um, <laughs> so, Gregor is the longest serving member of the commissioning team, and he looks after shows including Famalam, This Country, and Inside Number Nine. Um, we've got, we're going to do hopefully about 45 minutes of Q&A and then there'll be 15 minutes at the end for questions. So everyone holds off for a bit um, and hopefully we'll address some stuff along the way. Um, so Gregor, should we start with a little bit about you? Sure, sure. Cool. So, what do you want to know? Oh, what do we not want to know? <laughs> so, um, how did you get into TV? Well, what was your starting point? I, I sort of I just applied for a job that was in the paper, uh, so I had no sort of experience or connections or anything, but uh, the, there was the ITV company in, in Glasgow where I was from, uh, were looking for an entry level person uh, as a researcher on an, on an arts magazine programme, uh, so I got an interview for that, didn't get the job at all, but, but made enough of an impact on in the interview that the, the person who was hiring got in touch with me after and said, look, if you want to come in and pick up some experience, then you could do that. So I was like sort of literally the very bottom rung, like uh, not, I suppose the modern equivalent now would be like intern status, so it was unpaid, but uh, sort of at least got the very kind of bottom rung of, of just on seeing how TV, TV production was made. It was sort of like literally just putting things in envelopes and all that and, and running about after people. Uh, and But it, it was the sort of place, uh, you know, where they made a lot of kind of regional hours of TV and you could progress really quickly and get really hands-on really quickly. So it wasn't like a very, very hierarchical uh, sort of place to work. So within like sort of six months, uh, I was sort of properly researching on the show. And then within like a year after that, you were getting a chance to direct items and sound edit suites and, and, you know, sound mixing suites and be out location filming. And so with the, within like sort of, I don't know, two years or something, I was sort of producing and directing stuff. Yeah. And, and it, was, it was a way on, on my career. And uh, it was because you just got hands on so quickly. It was a great sort of learning ground, really. Yeah. And what kinds of shows were they? Was it comedy back then or not? Uh, yeah, well, more like there was always a kind of lot of coverage of the Edinburgh Festival, but more in a kind of an arts coverage way. So, so we weren't, so it wasn't like, you know, stuff that was scripted, really. That, that wasn't really in the diet of those sorts of stations, you know. It was I did some children's TV, some arts TV, some current affairs like that that's there's a lot of I guess again it, it was the nature of the times so there was a lot of sort of magazine shows type things so you're you, you maybe directing something with a band one day or, or then like a, a longer form uh you know 30 minute documentary and something the, the next day so I mean at that time I was really kind of keen to go into I, I sort of thought I'm going to be like a an important fly in the wall documentary maker making important films about important subjects that was really <laughs> kind of where I wanted to go and uh, it was just sort of like I guess so it didn't really have a kind of big idea of kind of going into comedy so it's very much like uh, just a, a journey that sort of evolved and like it gradually gradually uh, became more interested in that got in tow with people and people that were kind of really important to me and influential to me were all working in comedy and then yeah. You know, it was, it was that sort of like gradually started to really specialise in that and then got some opportunities to work in comedy. And then there came a point where I wasn't really doing anything else other than just comedy stuff. And it, then it, it sort of felt, so there's sort of like two stages really. There's a sort of early stages where I was just kind of freelancing around TV production, trying to get whatever gigs I could. And then a sort of second part of my career where I specialised much more in comedy and then progressed that way. Yeah. 
yeah 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 that sounds familiar doesn't it i feel like <laughs> no, no one starts with the dream job do they no, um, well yeah uh, uh, no uh, uh, it's, it's, it's true you know it's true i, th I think probably uh Oh, I could, you know, like, it's pointless me kind of going, oh, no, what it was like in my day and what it's like now. But, but you know, uh, I guess there's probably more opportunities, I think, in a way that you can reach out to people in a way you maybe couldn't then, just because of the social media and all sorts of things. Like, uh, uh, I think then, like I was saying, it was literally like a job ad in the paper that I sort of, like, had to write off and apply and done all, all that sorts of thing. I, th I think those sorts of opportunities very rarely exist now. I think you, you, it's really about opportunities you've got to kind of create for yourself uh but yeah you're right it's like you the, the uh, whatever you're always going to have to go through those bottom rungs of the ladder right uh, and i don't mean that in a sort of demeaning way it's just like it's a, a very complex world tv production there's a lot to kind of learn uh yeah. just about how things work technically and business wise and all that all those processes so at some point you kind of just the period where you get you know get your head around all that yeah and i think recognizing as well that you don't always know exactly which route you want to take i think sometimes it feels like you have to swear by being you know comedy obsessive since you were born <laughs> actually it's all right to, yeah and what about this role then so how did how did that happen hey I, I'd, I'd i mean i've been a sort of producer director writer like in, in comedy uh sort of development producer so i've done those sort of development roles uh, and and sort of made some of my own stuff as well and then the uh, so yeah it was just a again not something i've been sort of seeking out but uh the job of commission editor came up at the, at the bbc uh, i hadn't really ever thought about going into that i didn't really think i had much of a chance of, of getting it but it was a sort of speculative thing uh came into me and did there was cheryl taylor was the controller of comedy at the time uh and it made a kind of not rounds and rounds of formal interviewing but a kind of fairly scary panel of people uh but it was a lot of, i mean what was interesting to me was like it was very editorial focused it was about you know talent it was about shows it was about what you're watching about you know what things would you like to do where do you think what do you think we should be doing you know there's a little bit about the business end of things but it was an editorial discussion which you know anybody that's watches a lot of tv interest in making tv you know that's what we love isn't it you, you love sitting and the pub or a cafe just shooting the breeze about about shows and and what you're passionate about so uh it, it, you know like it was a good opportunity to do that and i didn't really think i would kind of get anywhere but got off of the job uh, and then there was a very very steep learning curve of uh going straight into the commissioning team and you know within a kind of matter of days if you know sort of starting to take meetings and and so there's a lot of kind of like i, I, mean, I think it probably takes you a good six months really to to, to really understand what's going to Fully, what's going on? Uh, yeah. it, it was quite a lot to take in. Yeah, yeah, um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about the commissioning process in, in a bit. But um, is there a moment that stands out for you, sort of in your current role, that you feel particularly proud of? I, I think proud of certain shows. Uh, I guess. I mean, the, it just it just prompts me to think about like those kind of very early days when I just joined the team. I remember like literally one of the shows. So so the way our commission team works, there was like sort of three, four, it was four commission editors now, but each commission editor will look after a set number of shows, each made by whichever independent producer. So like the idea is that uh, of all the indie producers that we deal with, they should be split roughly equally between uh, the commission editors. So there's a regular point of contact and it's not just like every new submission we get in from every company just as you know, has to start from scratch, finding it as home. So like, uh, so we sort of work with producers over time. So one of the shows I inherited when I, when I took up the job was, uh, was episodes which was made by Hattrick Productions uh, about a, a couple of writers in LA uh, adapting their, their hit UK show in, in, in America, uh, which starred Matt LeBlanc at the, at the time. Uh, and it was a big show for the channel and all that. And literally that week I started, like I think the Tuesday night, I had to go to dinner with all the people from the co-producers of HBO and all the talent on the show. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, sort of like the week before, I'd just been like sort of dossing around, literally not doing anything. Uh, and then sort of transported into like a dinner where all these, Eminent, eminent people are there. It was a kind of weird, like really kind of surreal, almost like a peek behind, you know, how all that kind of worked. Uh, but yeah, over over the, I think there's, you know, some of the shows you mentioned at the start there, this country, I think it's like just an incredible 
creative masterpiece. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, and I can't claim any sort of real responsibility for doing anything creative on it, but it's just a real privilege to see yeah. those people make that show. Uh, it is such such an, an amazing, amazing piece. And this, I think the other sort of inspiring thing to me is like those shows that you've had a part in a little bit along the way of like very important shows in, in, in the sort of comic tradition, like not going out and outnumbered and episodes, things like that, where you kind of got a chance to see, you know, amazing indie industry practitioners at the top of their game, the height of the powers, and see them quite, you know, up close. Uh, and sort of just real creative highlights, like Count Arthur Strong was a, was a show that, that I really, really loved to absolute bits and contains the single funniest thing that I've, I've ever seen in the episode the day the clocks went back and remember being in the gallery the night we recorded that episode at Pinewoods and, and literally, you know, there can be quite serious places, the gallery and there's a bit of pressure and all that, but literally falling off the chair laughing <laughs> at that. Uh, it, it was just, uh, yeah, so that's that's some of the things. And like, uh, the, the other... I did get advance notice of this question, so I managed to sort of let one sack my, my brains a little bit because I just forget everything otherwise. But uh, we made a single film a few years back. It was for Christmas called We Are Doomed. And it was the story of how sort of Dad's Army came to uh, in, into being. So it was the kind of Croft and Perry story, really, about how those writers came up with the idea, got together, and then made the show. And it sort of takes you from the first germ of the idea right up to the first night, the first episode of Dad's Army was broadcast. And uh, it f felt... You know, it's a great single film written by Stephen Russell and made by Darlow Smithson. They did an amazing job of it, but it also felt like incredibly special because it sort of felt like you were honouring that tradition of sitcom in this country. Dad's Army is like a show that still rates amazingly well on BBC Two now, and it's like it's been such a kind of landmark thing. And to sort of, you know, look at the creative journey that went into making it, uh, it, it was a kind of really weird meta thing because in a way you, you were you were sort of doing a show where you were, it was about the casting of and the creation of that but at the same time we were kind of casting the actors who would play those uh, actors in the, the film and all that so it, it, it's just for lots of reasons uh, that really felt like a really amazing yeah. special project. Yeah I think that's actually a, weirdly a really nice segue into um, that that's not it sort of feels like we have to address the coronavirus, right? During ah, this, yes, and, um, yes. but I just think this idea of you know, like the British tradition of comedy, this idea of it feeling sort of so past part of who we are, and using humour to sort of come through difficult times. Um, do you think it's changing sort of what our expectations of comedy might be going forward from here? Hey, it'd be interesting to see how all this impacts i mean i you know none, none of this is earth shattering insight but I, I, you know i think it's been noticeable that the people want to turn to something for comfort you know uh, uh, like the, the news agenda is incredibly bleak and we were all kind of completely wrapped and sucked into that obviously uh, especially at the outset of this that, that to find an alternative something that would offer you that light i mean we need that as human beings like that uh, and i think like you know maybe not immediately but quite quickly you know, you would you were trying to find a funny side of it. You know, like even the current sort of situation, bleak as it is, like you 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 know, you could see in social media or, or or just in conversations with your own friends and family, you would you would sort of like you know look at the ridiculousness or, or the surreality of it, and like that's a kind of human response to kind of find like uh, the, the humorous side of stuff. It I think it is a kind of comfort to us. So. Uh, so yeah, I think I think like the other thing that's really noticeable is I think that you can see the amazing value of uh, like the com comedies like have this kind of amazing long life that 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 now we might you know in our schedules like across all the broadcasters like be seeing a few more repeats and all that, or we might be going to the iPlayer and all that and and, and sort of finding things that we that are comfort viewing, and a lot of that tends to be comedy. You know, it's just a sort of fact of one of the amazing things about our genre is that the, the, the best examples of it really bear repeat viewing. Yeah. And in a way that, you know, maybe you, you, you would be unlikely to seek out and watch a kind of quiz show from years ago or whatever. Uh, not, nothing to denigrate those genres, but it's, there is something about the best sitcom work where it really rewards repeat viewing and, and it's a very enduring form and it's like done, done well. Yeah, I suppose Gavin and Stacey, you know, the Christmas special was a great example yeah. of the power yeah, I mean, that people just you know, want to go back to again and again. I think so, yeah. I mean, it, it, it was a really, it's an incredible story that because it sort of bucked all 
trend industry trends you would say about like the ability of like one show and a linear schedule to attract like a mass audience like that i mean it's an incredible uh, sort of uh, you know phenomenon really uh, and and if you sort of pick into like you know why did that happen you're very much very quickly into what are really kind of enduring uh, values about storytelling about like uh, characters the characters interrelationships dynamics recognizable worlds like you know warmth uh, but not you know that that's not a saccharine show it's got warmth in it but it's also got an authenticity and and, and moments of conflict and uh, you know it's it's an incredible set of characters uh, and to draw an audience like that uh, and hit the right sort of tonal notes uh, you know with the pressure of that slot and yeah, expectation so that it? yeah. it's an incredible feat yeah yeah absolutely yeah and um you know we've talked a little bit about the, the enjoying power of comedy and how well it does an eye player do you think um you know, thinking about people who might be listening here like do you think there's anything we'll take forward from it so sort of do you think the direction of travel of comedy in terms of the ideas that within our team we'd be looking for might change i think i think the there's obviously been a, a a response that, that everyone's had to make uh, in the industry because of the limitations of filming, right? Like, well, obviously for everyone, production went on pause. Scripted production tends to be quite complex, like the big, big units uh, involving a lot of cast, all that. So, uh, you know, within the restriction, impossible to make those kinds of shows. So, uh, obviously, there's been a lot of ingenuity and invention in how people have responded to that in creative ways. And like, so we've seen like a lot of pitches that have been set in lockdown, like have been and, and, and you know, would be filmed by these means, by, you know, Zoom or equivalents or whatever. Uh, but, and while there's been some good examples of that, you know, like there's, I think, uh, like Stage that's been on recently and on BBC One and is going to repeat, I think, from, from tonight on BBC One with Michael Sheen and David Tennant. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like that, that, that was a, a kind of bit of a sort of meta look in, into what that lockdown experience might be like for those kind of versions of, of, of themselves. So that was kind of one take on it. And then on the other hand, you've got, you know, comedians at, at home, like the show on, on BBC Two, where it's more quick fire and just a range of different things. Like, uh, yeah. but I think there's, to be honest, like there's a, there is a limit to that, what you can kind of do within those formats. Ultimately, scripted comedies, uh, uh, storytelling that draws in all the different dramatic devices, like of, of, of plot, of, of, of uh, comedic timing is really, really <laughs> difficult to do and you can't have more than one uh, person in one scene at one time when everybody's just in the boxes. So it's like a lot of your kind of basic tools of the trade, like you literally can't employ. And, 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 so, and also I think when we're looking at shows that do have such a long life and eye player, you, you, you know, there's always a, a sort of space for things that are very reactive and all of the moment, but we couldn't have, you know, the vast majority of our output of this year done like that because it would just be completely ephemeral on of the moment. It would be true to the moment, but it wouldn't have that kind of longer lasting legacy. So I think, you know, uh, pretty quickly we were kind of focused on we want to develop things that we will make out the other side of this and have the potential to return and, and you know, in years hence where hopefully this is a, a memory, all this stuff. Yeah, yeah. And I suppose, um, you know, it's obviously really difficult for all of the people who want to be writing and creating now. But I suppose, at least, you know, because of the long, um, because of how long it takes to get things made anyway, I, yeah. th I think it's probably fair to say that we've been trying to, people who yeah. can get on with writing, we've been trying to keep things in development so that when there is another we do yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Still have. yeah. It's, it's, it's hard. I, I genuinely think it's been a, a hard period yeah. creatively. I, I sort of, I, not obviously from a sort of pure business and money flow uh, point of view, I get an incredible sort of hard, hardship and anxiety and uncertainty. But also, I think just purely creatively, it's difficult. I think there's a sort of pat thing to say, well, you've been stuck in the house, so it must be great for writing. Uh, yeah. There's yeah. nothing else to do, but actually you, the creative mind doesn't work like that at all. Like when you're occupied with like worry or, you know, what's going on or, or, or I want to keep yeah. clicking on the news to find out what's happening. You know, that that's a barrier to, to, to the sort of intense creative thought that you need to, to write, you know, scripts or whatever. Uh, and, and, you know, and I think as well, like we always respond to stimulus around us, you know, like uh, even if you're writing something, I don't know, say you're writing something that's historically set or it's, you know, set, in a space station or whatever, you, it's not like you aren't still influenced by the events of your everyday life. Do you know what I mean? It's like, so, yeah, so cool. the fact that we went through this incredibly intense period with like a lot of this stress and, and worry, I think is, is 
it's going to find its way into what people are writing, uh, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, and, and, and navigating that is, is a, you know, it's fine in a way for us to kind of say, well, look, these are our priorities. We're thinking way down the line, but that's not how human beings work. They kind of worry about the moment, like the moment to moment they're living in. So uh, it's, it's going to be a really, you know, it's a difficult thing to kind of work out. Everybody's kind of just got to work through. I think you see signs now where people for a while just you couldn't even really comprehend what a kind of an end in sight was and, and what sort of what normal was going to mean and all that. And I think now you can at least start to get a bit of a kind of grasp on that and there's a sense like there's the you know of, of how things may work and, and so that again will have an impact on on the type of stuff that people are writing and developing. Yeah of course. I mean I think it'd be really interesting. You know you hope that everyone gets through it right and um, comes out of it with interesting ideas. But it's very interesting to see, I think to see like what direction comedy goes in along with all the other genres. Yeah I think I think as well like I mean again this isn't like particularly a shattering insight and it's not particularly to our genre but it's clearly been a period where lots of people have really reflected on their lives, right? What am I doing with my life, right? Well, like, yeah, uh, yeah, and, yeah. and that that might mean like you know uh, I've got to stop this now uh, because I'm not getting anywhere. But equally, it might be, uh, do you know what? I've always really wanted to give comedy a go. I've always wanted to write something, or I've you know, I've wanted to diversify my business and start trying to get into that. And so for some people, so excuse me. Uh, uh, for for some people, there'll have been a kind of real sort of moment through yeah. those periods where like, you know, they're, they're going to change course. Yeah, yeah, you'd hope so. Yeah. Um, shall we talk a little bit about the commissioning process, so how it works? Um, hopefully that's useful for everyone. It's very difficult sure. to know what people want to hear when you can't see anybody, but um, let's assume people are interested in um, pitching. Should we start to start with pitching? So obviously that's sort of the beginning yeah. of, of a, the process. Um, could you just tell us a little bit about what a good pitch looks like to you? Yeah, yes. I mean, for for us, uh, so there's. Oh, I'm going to end up wandering and waffling, so just try and keep me on a on a on a, on a straight line. But uh, I'd say there's a couple of different ways you could look at this. So there's there's pitches which are like uh, producers coming in with a project, usually in the form of an hour long meeting, where they'll they'll and it's there. It's on them basically to the commissioner to kind of outline what the program idea they have is probably for us, what the talent involved, who are the talent involved. Uh, and then you'd have a sort of discussion where uh, the commission editor, you'd interrogate the idea basically, right? And, and you'd sort of like probe around, like try and find what's funny about it. Where's the, you know, what's the longevity? Maybe at that early stage, even channel destination slot, that sort of thing, tone, where it might kind of go. Uh, so, so, you know, it's not really incumbent on the producer to dot all that. That, that. That's really our business. But at that stage, you know, you're not just assessing whether something has got potential and is good or bad, like if you want to put it like that, but you're also kind of mentally kind of going, well, where are our gaps? What, what opportunities have we got coming up? Because, you know, you can't commission every show. Uh, so it's about where would this fit and where would this add range with the stuff we've already got coming up? So you're kind of having that dialogue in your head about like interrogating the idea, but also thinking, will this replicate something that we've got? Is it treading on the toes of something else? Or is it going to be something that adds range? Is this talent that we're really super keen to work with? Or, you know, so, so, so you're, that, that's the basic thing. And out of that meeting, like our standard, and again, there's all sorts of subtle variations to this, but our kind of main sort of unit of development currency is the commission script. So at that stage, if it's a producer pitching an idea, whether or not the writers there in the room as well, uh, the next stage would be for us to fund like a half hour script of that. Again, like, you know, there is variations to this. It might be that if it's a writer performer or a character act, you might say, rather than a kind of half hour script on paper, what would be great is like a little taster tape, so five minutes where you're just kind of capturing the essence of this character on yeah. camera. So, or, or it might be like, okay, uh, there's a script already. Uh, so it's, it's, been, it's been sort of like pitched as a spec script. So we're not sort of having to fund that development stage, but we might fund a rewrite or, or some future storylines and then, or, or quickly progress to like a, a table read where we would fund the producer to then sort of cast it and pull actors together to sort of perform that at a, a table read where we would sort of better assess like the scripts because it's not just on the page by that point, you're kind of, you know, it's on its feet and living and breathing. So, so there's that sort of formal, you know, book a meeting, 
uh, come in and pitch a project like that. But, you know, we are a very talent-led genre, you know, and like, so equally, uh, Edinburgh Festival or, or, you know, any gigs through the year that any, any member of the commissioning team uh, are attending, you, you're always kind of open to something special and, and, and good, like coming across your path. And like somebody, you know, if you see a show that you think is terrific, then you kind of want to know who the writers are, or you see a stand-up hour that you think is terrific, you kind of maybe want to know whether they've got any narrative ideas. And so that might not be kind of formal pitching. It might not be somebody grabbing you and say, here's this idea, but like it's the start of a conversation that might kind of lead to developing a show. So, you know, we're really kind of open more and more to all those different ways of a starting point. And that's, that's what, you know, you're always, the basic building block is, is producer with talent, with kind of concept idea and it's those those three things that yeah. and if they all kind of chime and you've got something exciting then you're kind of then it's a case of right okay how do we get to the next stage of whatever this might be yeah yeah and i think you know your point about range and sort of not just recruiting new talent from all the same places and this idea of finding talent online like going to shows um like being really important for having ideas that speak to all different parts of the audience, I think feels really important. And I think your slate reflects that if you look at the shows that you look after, they all feel yeah. very specific to... Yeah, no, no, no one person can be, uh, you know, it's so splintered and huge, like uh, yeah. the, the, the sector that we kind of work in, everybody from like people, you know, making TikToks or, or just like having a, a, a funny sort of Twitter account or whatever, right, you know, right across live work to, you know, people do the short film circuit, all, all those, and the live circuit. So, you know, no one person can be across all that, like emerging talent, you know? So, so we, you know, we're in the dialogue. That's what we kind of want to be in with our yeah. the producers that we work with, we're kind of going like, who, you know, who have you seen that who, who's come across your path that you find exciting? And, and you know, I think there's, uh, I genuinely mean this, I think there's, 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 I think there's a, 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 you know, a perception that commissioning's, well, it is about saying no to a lot of things, right? Because like you can't, you can't commission everything, right? You, there isn't, there isn't the money or the space and, and the schedules to do that. So of course, like uh, it's it's a truism that you know ninety percent of development work ends in failure. If you judge success or failure by you know do you get commissioned or not? Uh, but it's not the case that we are sort of coming at everything from the starting point of going, I want to pick a hole in this and find a reason to say no. It's it's the reverse of that. Every new thing, every new act you see, every new script you read. You, you're coming at it with the utter optimism, you know, of going, this might be an amazing thing. I'd love to find an amazing new thing. I mean, that, that's, that's, you know, yeah. what, what should always be inspiring you and firing you is, is, is yeah. the possibility of finding something amazing, you know? So, yeah. so every, every, literally every script I, I kind of start reading and I'll read to the end is, is like, maybe this would be amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I thought that's the most exciting thing for me is you get an email from someone saying, look, I really believe in this idea. Will you have a look? Like that to me is a really exciting moment. When you're I think, yeah, it's, yeah. I, th I think as it's, it's, it's well for, for new talent, I mean, I think, you know, I, I know we've got an, on the call today, there'll be a lot of like producers and people that work in indies and stuff already. Uh, but for talent specifically, I think, uh, it, it, you know, it can be really hard to break into the, the industry, isn't it? You know, like, and, and uh, uh, you'll see like a lot of indies or, or uh, talent agents will say we don't accept unsolicited material that sort of thing so how you know like there's that perennial question of like how do you break in how do you make your opportunities if that's like if the walls sort of, if there's a high wall or the doors are slightly closed to you and but I always sort of think there's the, the the powerful thing you've got on your side is that you know can people afford not to look at something that might be an amazing new thing you know yeah. you don't want to be the the the, the person that you know didn't turn down the Beatles type thing, you know, <laughs> just like you, you know, so that you've got on your side if somebody passionate with with you know who's who's convincing and passionate and and as is an exciting uh, producer if they're coming at you with going like you know this this idea this person or these people that, that I'm working with they are great you know let me tell you more about them then of course you're gonna you're not gonna yeah. you know shut 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 your eyes and ears yeah. to that. Yeah, yeah, I think that's Daisy May Cooper, wasn't it? I think she said, she yeah. said people are desperate for good ideas. And it's, it's true. It's, it's, I think there's this perception that it's a really closed door. And it's, 
I hope we're doing quite a lot of work to change yeah. that to make it feel like it's more open yeah. for everyone. Um, it's that, I mean, it's not to say that it's easy, you know, no. it's like there's obviously like to get a shot all the way, you know, and make it a success is an incredibly hard thing and it's like a rare journey, but, but you know, but yeah, like there's, I think you've got to kind of look at, at it that, that there, you do still have some things on your side and like having a great project or a great talent is the ultimate thing that will yeah. get through any door. Totally. Um, just to try and make it sort of t tangibly helpful yeah. for people, if you were to sort of summarise as... In, what would you say are the sort of three most important elements of, of a good pitch? If, for what I mean, for me personally, I, I'm uh, I'm not really kind of uh, that bothered about really, you know, uh, polished singing documents. You know, like that 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 are like all put together with pictures and they're amazing. Uh, I mean, it's nice to get those, you know, and like they they obviously kind of show a lot of commitment and diligence and thought and creativity. But really, you're you're looking for that essence. You just want to kind of grab that essence of where, right, okay, I get what this show is. Uh, that, that's the thing. And, and that can be done in a kind of few paragraphs or just a page, you know? The be I mean, the best pitches, and there's a real knack to them, and I know it's incredibly difficult, and no one likes writing these documents. Uh, you're, you're bloody weird if you enjoy doing those. Uh, everybody sort of hates it. Uh, but the best ones explain what the idea is, uh, who it's about, and also somehow capture a bit of the voice and the attitude of the comedy within that document. And I don't mean by that, here's, you know, an extract with some jokes in it. I just mean like, even in the kind of writing of it, they've kind of managed to kind of just capture the take. So there's a sort of, you know, synergy between like, these are the facts, what it's about, who it's about, but also in the kind of voice of it, you kind of get a feel for what the comic angle, where they're coming from comedically. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's a couple, uh, like, there's, uh, uh, we've got a show with, uh, in the works with Rose Matafeo, uh, and she pitched, uh, or we had a meeting with Rose, and she then followed up with a pitch for an idea. Uh, and it so beautifully did all those things. It was just, it was completely in our voice as a performer. I'd seen, I'd seen our, you know, a couple of our shows and kind of knew where she was coming from as a performer. Uh, and the idea was really kind of clear, uh, but also it was completely infused with her sort of unique voice as a writer performer. Uh, and so the concept was really clear. Her as a talent was like really kind of clear part of the package and the way they'd done the treatment was like, you could really see where the kind of comedy was going to come from as well. And like that, that we green like that to script right away. The day, I mean, this not everything that happens this way, I have to say, but like literally the day the script landed, I was so excited to read it. I read it that day and we commissioned a, you know, a table read, like literally like the following day, you know? Uh, uh, so it's, it's, it's just, as I say, not every, not every project will, will do that journey, but uh, I think that's, that's the, the thing about it, you know, I think there's, there's other, there's other, you know, sides of this, which are, it slightly depends on your writing talent. Mm -hmm. If you're pitching to a commissioning team uh, and it's a new writer, uh, then having a page explaining the idea isn't really quite enough to go on, you know, because you, you can sort of read a page and go, well, okay, this, this is a, a plausible idea, but, uh, you know, it, it could be good or, it, you know, how, how will we know? So if it's somebody that's kind of new, I think you do have to be prepared to either supply some samples of writing or to do some script samples or something that would, you know, be indicative of like, this is what the voice and the talent of this writer is, uh, something that represents that. And like, I know that's a kind of vexed question, that whole thing about speculative work, but you know, you're, you're ultimately it's, it's buyer seller type thing, you know, as a seller, you, you, you've got to kind of at times, Kind of show this is what it is that that, that, that we are that we are selling, you know, and and, yeah. and uh, it's fair to say I think it doesn't have to be, you know, like I think sometimes people ideas that I've seen, you know, people will send you six fully crafted episodes, a series outline, and actually you don't you don't need that. Is that's fair to say? Sort of a couple of sample scenes is yeah. enough, isn't it? No, to... very, very very good point. Yeah, I think that that's sort of look, probably wasted effort in a way. You know, I think yeah. you kind of want that first episode. In fact, to be honest, if I, if I ever get sent like a script for a first episode and like a big treatment, then, you know, you'll read the scripts because that's what the audience get. They don't get the, the advantage of kind of reading about it first. So you, you, they've got, you know, everything's got to be done in the scripts and, and the story and all that's got to become apparent and hook you in in the scripts. Uh, yeah. So that's yeah. the thing that, yeah. you know, yeah. it, it, it all hinges on.
yeah, I think that's also the bit you're most excited by, isn't it? Sort of the, the script is what is ultimately going to go go on the screen. Yeah, and and yeah, the, and obviously there's then can be very lengthy journeys around script sure. development. I know there's you know again there's your classic sort of old black hole of development or or too many hands or you know notes that go you know say one thing and then the next set of notes say something else. I mean, I guess those things probably do happen sometimes. But it can be a little bit of a kind of tortured process, but I mean. Ultimately, this is all built around the idea of, you know, uh, there being a sort of an optimum, you know, way of kind of telling a story and 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 realizing all the potential out of a kind of story and and a setup and a uh, and a talent. So like mm -hmm. that that process is is you know built on that kind of like idea that you know nobody right off the bat manages to put all the words in the right order. And, sort of you know give you the absolute best version of this story it's going to take a little bit of they're very kind of complex kind of you know stories and there's a lot of different moving parts in them and yeah. so they'll take a little bit of nudging and finessing and you know and i think like that process where if we've commissioned a script and then the producer comes back and go here's a draft well okay well we love we love all these things about it but these things we weren't sure about and like could you do these in a different way or don't know. so that sort of dialogue that creative dialogue is really just trying to kind of find you know the, the best the best shape and form of that of that idea uh, and you do learn a lot about it as you kind of you know i think like it's not just about the idea itself and like what are the possibilities and and, and the limitations of it but also the people you're working with you know like uh uh and then that's not to say like oh md that you know doesn't do a note you immediately blackballed not like that at all you want people to be passionate and like clear about what they themselves want to do it's ultimately it's got to be the writer producer's vision that you're making you can't force people into that it's pointless so but but i think you know engagement and respect and and you know that's got to be a two-way street like all through those conversations and you're kind of trying to build up that coalition of trusts where you're all creatively sort of buying into the same thing and trying to get it to be its best thing and you know as, yeah. as a commissioning department we i think one of our core values is, is, is that sort of support like you know it's like we'd be there to nurture and support and, and help create people realize their visions you know it's not not about us saying you know change that 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 and you've got a commission that that's yeah. you know, absolutely alien to how we would approach yeah that. Yeah, yeah, and it's not about interfering either. It's about it's about trying to get it to the best, the best possible place for the person yeah. to find it, isn't it? But it's, it's hard that you know because there there will come things right. If you're like a bit further down the end of the road, say you've got a pilot or something, right, or it's commissioned to pilot or even series, then at that point there's a discussion about some of the kind of key parts of what your show will be, like the casting, like the appointment of some of those key roles, like director and stuff. Uh, now like that kind of sign off of that like some of that uh, can be quite subjective right like uh but other parts of it can be you know uh, from a position of where the broadcast is coming with a degree of knowledge or insight uh about those kind of appointments which is really kind of worth listening to so uh so some of it will be yeah i mean yeah you can get a line in the script right and you can do a read through of it and then at the end like you know there's three different views and whether you know somebody says no it's great as it is somebody says no 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 it doesn't work at all and somebody says i think it'll work if you just change this bit you know about it so these these are subjective things and somebody there that's the just a that's their job isn't it like to to ultimately be the, the arbiter of all that and kind of take all those different views and kind of help still just keep it on track and be true to the vision of it you know yeah. uh, but there's other parts of it where you know the, the, it's it's just a fact that there, there is an expensive genre to make shows in you know and and ultimately it's a creative fun process yeah but there is also a point where it's like an organization giving another organization a large sum of money to go off and deliver something and like agreeing what that thing is and that in that sort of basic kind of contract and understanding you know like uh, uh it, that can go wrong, wrong in lots of different ways right so so again, that's the thing about the development path, hopefully kind of giving everybody that's involved like that degree of trust and respect and like, you know, we, are, we're, we all want the same thing here. We all want to make a great show, but yeah. there will be times when we'll be coming at it from slightly different, you know, of uh, points of yeah. view. Yeah, which actually sort of, I mean, maybe you've already answered this, but sort of with that in mind, I guess, like, what do you think makes a really good commissioner? What are the... I, think, I mean, oh, there's, you know, 
everything's really about kind of the radar for um, just that ability to kind of spot something or be, or be alive to, to something when you see something that's got potential, I think, you know. Uh, it's it's uh, kind of easy, not easy, but it's like there is a way of doing it, which is a little bit stocks and shares or algorithms, however you want to call it, where you kind of go, well, uh, it's person that wrote that, starring person from that, and it's about something this issue that's Trending. been yeah. in the air but yeah exactly right yeah. so if you put all those ingredients together bang right you got it right so so yes we should commission that show uh, and you know in some ways those sort of sorts of packages not as not as you know kind of brutal as that but they they'll still exist things like that you know like uh, and we are in just driven like the whole industry always has been like a little bit of a stocks and shares game like if you're as an actor if you're in a show that's a massive hit then you'll find lots of opportunities coming off the back not because you were doing your work any different in that show than your previous job but just because that job you know has that show has been a hit so like it's the alchemy of that as the glow around it's a halo it's like everybody involved in that then you know it spreads it spreads outwards but you've got to be able to kind of be you know, like the ability to judge slightly outside of all that and, and just have that sense of when you something's exciting and got possibilities. And and, and it's a real, uh, you know, uh, well, in saying it's a difficult art, and it's not to say I, I have mastered this, but you've mastered. it's like <laughs> make terrible, terrible mistakes and you've got to ultimately just go on your, your gut. Not, not, I say that not, and you know, going things on my personal taste like that, that's largely something you've just got to put to one side because we're thinking on behalf of our audience and yeah. like uh, we're serving them ultimately. Uh, and it's, you know, so, so it's not really totally what I think uh, all the time. Uh, but yeah, you, you, it's, it's, I think that's the biggest thing. You, you, there's big teams, right? Uh, like, and I don't just mean the BBC, like any organization, like, as I say, it's a complex thing and it's like, it's expensive. And so things like the business deals and the rights and all that, you can lean on other people. It's great to have a bit of working knowledge as a commissioner about a lot of different things, but you don't really have to be an expert on absolutely everything. I think you kind of you're just having that kind of that bit of a, you know a linchpin between all these different elements and just kind of try and, and, and keep the creative thing at the foremost and help them navigate through all these different like complicated hurdles. Yeah. Uh, and that's the sort of art of it. And you need yeah. to be sort of, you know, a lot of it's just, you know, isn't fun stuff. It's been resilient through tough times and like shoots that go wrong and, and or, you know, marketing campaigns that everybody hates or things like that, you know, can be very, can become very, very vexed questions, but you just trying to be that kind of champion of the project all the way through. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we're going to do questions in a couple of minutes, but just finally, is that sort of, you've touched a little bit on this country, but, is there anything you've just really loved being part of? Or anything on, on at the moment that you really admire? Uh, I think it's difficult to look past I May Destroy You just now. I think it's been like, like I already can tell is like a really seminal work, you know? Uh, and, and sort of interesting in this sense that uh, it feels like a completely new and sort of almost groundbreaking thing. But, but that's but if you'd really break it into its constituent parts, there's nothing. You know, it's just a great bit of storytelling. Like, but it's like the, the it's the authenticity and truth uh, from which it comes in the way it's been told, and 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 it's sort of in a way, it feels like really stylish and all that. But it, but it's not nothing's sensationalist or gimmicky or anything. Like it feels like classic as well. Yeah. Uh, to me, it's like when it, the way it's stylized is only to make you feel everything more. It's not stylized yeah. ever for the sake of being stylized to me yeah and and and, and, that, and it instantly uh involving and compelling so even yeah. if you're not from the of the world that it sort of depicts like it, it's not like all oh, right this isn't for you you know it's still like uh, Im immediately compelling yeah. uh so i think that's been a real a real kind of standout creative thing i, I think yeah. we've had great some great stuff i've loved the other one that that's just finished its run i think on yeah. on bbc one uh holly walsh and a brown show i think that that's terrific and we've got a couple of really exciting new things uh that i probably aren't on quite yet but have had the privilege of watching uh with one mandy uh, uh which is uh, in a new series uh coming from diane morgan but she's written and directed we did a short uh, of this on bbc two 
couple of years back. And there's a series of them coming up. It's a fantastically funny, raucous bit of character, comedy, and brilliant stories. I think that's amazing. And I've really loved uh, Behind the Filter that's just recently launched on BBC Three, Phoebe Walsh's uh, piece. Uh, I think that's fantastic, really worth searching out. Nice, thank you, Gregor. That's it, interrogation over. <laughs> yeah, no, no to that, but yeah. Um, okay. Right, so no, what, we're gonna, what I'm going to try and do is go through some of the questions on the chat um, and put them to Gregor. Um, yeah, feel free to add anything now. And I'm going to try and put the questions that feel sort of most relevant to the most people um, here, if that's all right. Um, so let's start with this. Um, so someone here has asked, is there anything that Gregor regrets commissioning and why? Well, I mean, obviously not every show you ever commission is going to be a success. And like there's, there's certainly ones that, that, you know, have performed that well. Or I mean, it's not less worried about critical pannings and all that. I mean, like, like that's comedy is weird as a genre. It elicits incredibly strong responses, you know. And like that in the audience, but true, the critics especially. And so, and especially in the mainstream, there's a very kind of sneering attitude towards uh, especially mainstream comedy. And uh, it's quite unforgiving. So especially if you're launching something like in the glare of like kind of BBC One, and, and, there's, some, and there's something about the way shows that are launched, which is effectively saying, we think this is brilliant because you're kind of going, uh, you know, there's a publicity campaign, people are, I don't know, the cast are doing the chat show circuit and so, you know, there's, there's trails all over the place and all that. So, so like, if, if you, you can sort of hit that with an, an audience that's just watching it with their sort of arms folded going, right, come on then, make me laugh, uh, uh, added to a kind of slightly sneery, like, you know, sort of uh, press that are sort of view, like mainstream comedy is like a bit of a shitty form like uh, and will only like very kind of like certain things uh that can be a real perfect storm and and i'm you know i'm being careful not to name specific shows because a bit unfair but like certainly had i think that's been the most disappointing times uh, i've been like the things that have been kind of big mainstream things but everybody giving their best and like uh and they're having been a very kind of you know strong creative idea in there and it wouldn't have gone the distance without that yeah. but uh and it's not, I mean, I'm, I, you can't say, right, I'm blaming the failure of some shows on the hostile press reaction or whatever by the, you know, the comedy press. That's, that's, would be, you know, silly to, yeah. you know, the, the, they've not worked because they've not, they've not managed to entertain like a big enough audience, right? That's what shows stand or fall on, you know, they, yeah. they, the, the audience, judge and jury in our business, like, and yeah. they will decide whether. Yeah. It's also fair yeah. to say that you get the least ideas, don't you, for mainstream, mainstream comedy? Yeah, I think, I think <laughs> that, and that's maybe a thing why it, it, you end up like, you know, more disappointed or, or harder hit on those shows because like you sort of really, it feels like the, the writers and, and actors and producers have sort of stuck their neck out in a way. It's, it's the yeah. strangest thing. Yeah. That, like the, the, the platforms with the access to the widest audience are sort of the most derided, like in, in, in our landscapes quite odd and it sort of means there's a bit of creative fear where yeah. some some people won't sort of think well no that's not really for me it's a bit too unforgiving and and, and the other unfortunate thing is that people second guess yeah uh, creatively what might work there so we kind of get a lot of pitches that feel a little bit lame or denuded or, or just don't have that kind of spark or bite because i think because people are kind of going well bbc one you know that will never work for bbc one oh, that'll be too yeah. strong for bbc one and people are already self-censoring and inhibiting themselves creatively uh yeah. And so, so, for me that's why ghost is such an exciting yeah. proposition for one isn't it it sort of yeah. shows that you can be mainstream and feel quite risky it looks so easy right yeah. <laughs> see, something, see something that does it so beautifully but but you know if you sort of think about that i know they were a very established you know an unusual talent performing unit uh but that is a one-line pitch isn't the most sort of promising i think you could pick all sorts of worries uh, and reservations about it but like it's yeah as you say it's been a an amazing show. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Right, let's let's pick another one out of here. Um, I'm not going to be able to do all of these just to let everyone know, and I'm not. Um, is there anything that any sort of territories, any pitches that feel a bit overdone that you might not be interested in? Uh, 
it, well, like I say, at the minute, just, just purely at the minute, like the sort of like lockdown landscape, I don't think it's something we want to do. Yeah. Uh, the standard answer to this is always used to be like, oh, flat share comedy, that's been done to death and that. But I think really as a sort of form, we can almost like just ended up going past that anyway. You know, it's like the idea of like, uh, we are right, we're just sort of shoving four people in the room and they'll, they'll say funny things, you know, like that. that's the whole sort of form has kind of moved on from that. And so we're into like, you know, what is the story here and what, how does it evolve? And more, more than that, I think it's like, you can't really do anything without characters that have genuine psychological depth. You know, you can do stuff that's quite broad comedically or like has physical stuff and all that sort of thing. Or, or, or you can do stuff that's like much, you know, sales much closer to drama where there's challenging emotional things or, or like quite yeah. serious stuff in the, in the stories will happen to those those characters but you know in either form you still need that uh, real characters with like you know incredible psychological depth yeah. that, and there's, a, there's one thing I think like a, a, an aspect of that which which is that there there's been a lot of sort of I don't know if you could call them like sort of confessional first person shows where it's about like probably something that's that's well, something that's genuinely happened, an experience that's being mined by the creator, uh, and there's been amazing examples of that. But I think, in a way, you know, I think for everyone, like us on our side of the fence and the creative community as well, you're starting to kind of go, okay, well, uh, you're also looking for what what is the universality of this, and like, and and those kind of shows still need to be inventive in form, and it's you know, it's not just enough to be like a a personal testimony it's got to have like a comedic angle as well yeah. that, and, and 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 i think uh you know we we are we'll be very much think in terms of returning serious you know like we do the odd thing like the odd one off especially around christmas and that and we might do some 60 minute things uh or you know like short series but really everything that we're trying to find in the, in the short form where we're commissioned say 15 minute singles and stuff or or the kind of shorter pilots that we'll do at BBC Three really everything is still through the kind of lens of does could this be a returning show is there a submission you know yeah uh, fuel in this tank yeah that I've loved about being in the team is that you know everything's commissioned with intent everyone believes in you know even when you're commissioning a taster or just a, a short you know 10 minute script or threesome everything's commissioned because it's really believed in and it, there's yeah. a genuine belief there's an onward journey that could come after it even if it the initial commission is quite small I think yeah. that understanding that everything you know is being commissioned for a reason people really believe yeah. it, want it to go somewhere is really important and I, I really admire yeah 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 everything exactly something that's sort of something that's rich in possibility that should be like a kind of core thing yeah. like a core quality of anything we commission that it's got that and that makes everything exciting as well doesn't it it's sort of right i'm digressing okay there's quite a few questions here about producers about sort yeah. of the role of the producer and how so sort of the key, what, what would you say are the key skills i suppose about um of being a comedy producer and that's a question that marcus has asked and a couple of other people have mentioned as well yeah well i mean it's, it's a it's a classic uh, question isn't it? what does the producer do and like you know yeah. when you get uh, beside your auntie at christmas dinner it's a, it comes a really difficult thing to sort of explain uh, but I think like the biggest thing really is is your your talent radar and, and also your ability to interact with talent and that's you know that can be just like being a, a stand up show on a Tuesday night and being the person that kind of spots somebody with a bit of talent and then being able to you know have the front and the charm to be able to kind of then go and follow that up. Uh, but you have to be very dealing with talent and nurturing talent from that very very nascent stage. You know, like uh, it takes a lot of different qualities you know you've got to be very empathetic but you've got you've got to be brilliantly nurturing creatively because it is a long journey you know uh, and starting from the point of view of like nothing where you've got a blank sheet of paper but you've got somebody that you know you, you're excited by creatively you're going well okay what we have you have you got any ideas and then you being that first sort of uh you know that that first uh, you know shoulder or, or first uh, eye on something like to give that kind of feedback and then do that steering to progress it from that just just you know like one idea in somebody's head to progress to multi multiple series is an incredible sort of journey to have to go on and it takes all sorts of different human skills all the way along 
Uh, but I think, you know, so all, all the things I was saying about resilience and determination and everything like go tenfold for producers because like it's such an unforgiving business, you know, and like you're pushing boulders up hills all the time and uh, to get knockbacks, to put a lot of time into stuff, like the, to be doing all that work for no financial rewards until like the promise of it further down the line somewhere, that's an incredibly unforgiving task. So you so need those qualities of, of just determination and resilience that are so, so important. Uh, and you've got to bear all that quite lightly, you know, because like there's, there's, a, there's a horrible thing of, of in this industry where nobody really wants to hear your difficulties, you know? So when you kind of go and you're pitching to a broadcaster or you're a networking drinks thing at the BFI or I don't know, whatever it is, or the Ember Festival, you've kind of got to be that excited, passionate person like the, the, the people just actively want to be around and do business with you want to, you want to do business with those people you go, that, that person's great she's great she's got like a ton of ideas women, of so enthusiastic yeah well you know it's it's like there's you know let's not you know like pretend that it's not been dominated by usually male-led like sort of big captains of industry type thing you know it's like like if you look at all the shows have been made here across the broadcasters for the last 34 years. Like a lot of them have been made by traditional comedy specialist indies, the big powerhouses, and they've made a great creative work. Yeah. But you know, we 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 as a commission team definitely want to be open to like all sorts of new voices, and and that goes for the producers as much as it goes for the talent. You know? Yeah, it's probably not time to talk about it here, but you know, we've got we're trying to put things in place, aren't we? Like the small indies fund, the very recent announcement about uh, committing 100 million to diverse voices, like which we, yeah, it's it's probably not a space to talk about. It. If yeah. you go onto the website, there's a lot of different schemes and initiatives which exist to try and. Help yeah, food. yeah, and, and I mean, yeah. it is. Of course, it's a meritocracy because, like I was saying, if you serve the audience, it's our duty to give the audience the best shows that we can find. Yeah. Right. And so, but so, so we can't be in a situation going like, well, we're going to cut all this up, and we're going to like, well, percentage of this, these people get that, and it's, it's, you've got to, you know, the audience deserve the best work. That's what our contract with the audience is. But at the same time, I think you know, there's lots of things you can do in commissioning, like to try and if level the playing field's wrong terminology, but. We're not expecting everything to be, it's, it's hard, right? If you're a kind of small one person indie and you come with an exciting talent and you're up against like a massive uh, indie that's, that's got huge track records and are backed by like an American studio and they can come in with the top end talent on front and behind camera, that's a difficult thing to compete with, right? I mean, that's, of course, it's going to turn any sort of uh, broadcaster's head when like a big talent package like that arrives. But what, I don't, what we can do is go like, okay, well, look, uh, this producer's really got something about them. Like, this is an exciting thing. They've notched it very impressively. So let's go on that journey. If it's some support, like, as you said, we've got different funds and, and routes that we can sort of support producers, but also just have the patience with an idea to kind of go like, okay, can't expect it to jump, not 60 so quickly, you know, but, but if, if we can, you know, back the script and then and maybe partner them up with another company or, or just have, like, you know, have the patience and judgment, like, to, to try and, treat every single thing as, as an individual thing and that's got individual needs and you know yeah. to try and sort of nurture that yeah and i think it's fair to like as an industry there's still a lot of work to do right to make it feel like a more egalitarian place um but you know things like screen skills creative access the schemes that we have um the women in film and tv there's there are hopefully more routes through now than there once were i think that's probably yeah. fair to say yeah 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 and, and yeah exactly there's actually a question here that I think is probably relevant to this discussion, which is that around, um, this is probably the last question we've got time to take, but are there, are there gaps in representation that you want to fill in comedy? Yeah, I mean, we, of course there is, like we, we've got to, uh, you know, what one is sort of our sort of duty, like to be able to represent the, the whole UK and all its different sort of forms of and experience. Uh, and so that goes for like gender or sexual orientation, ethnicity, all those sort of things like make up like diversity and how we reflect, you know, the UK back to itself. So, you know, we will never be able to do a complete job of that, obviously. But uh, what we, the more you can increase the range in what you're kind of doing at any one snapshot in time, then over time we should hopefully be able to kind of build a better picture of what we do. So that's really at the core, core of like everything that we do genuinely. I think we are kind of, you know, there's not an idea or a proposal uh, or a show that, that that we don't look at and analyze from from a point of view how can we 
you know, uh, see this through the lens of the diversity of the UK and how can we sort of Im Im improve what we're doing. But it's like, you know, there is just inevitably like a long time lag in how we, you know, from what we commission now to being on screen can be 18 months, two years, you know, and uh, it's not, it's really genuinely difficult to make instant changes, it's sort of impossible really. And that's not to you know, put my head in the sand at all, like about the need, need for that. Uh, but it, it, it's 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 just something that will take a bit bit of time to kind of come through. But I mean, already I think like in terms of you know uh, we have a better split in terms of female written uh, uh, work on, uh, on our slate. Uh, and, you know, and, and we were being rightly to, uh, held to task for that like a few years ago. And, but even in the space of a couple of years, you'd be able to see like a lot of that work that we had going at you know at that time started to come through and make it to screen. And and that will just continue, I think. But we've got you know. That's not to say we don't have a lot of challenges and still, you know, there's times where you can take a snapshot of like, well, say, I don't know, the first three months of BBC One last year, look at what we had on that channel and like, was that, was there enough range in that? And, and was that a sort of, was there a diversity of experience and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, on, on screen and behind camera on those shows? Well, probably not enough, you know? And yeah. so uh, we've got to take that, we've got to be serious about how we kind of address that so that, you know, it, it, you'll never get it perfect, uh, but you know at least you might be able to say, "Well, look at any sort of cross section on any of the channels." Like you can yeah. say, "Well, look, there's there's a there's a decent range there," you know. Yeah. And there's, and I, there's think, sort of, yeah. you know. I think for me, that's like you know, I think the thing that we've, we we really believe, and I think is so true, is this idea of um, you know more diversity of thought in terms of people's ideas. Like, is better comedy often, yeah. right? Like yeah. talking about. 100%. Yeah, and I think who's fine. making the exciting work, you know? Who's exactly, and it's work? like that's often where the most exciting ideas come from the voices that haven't been heard in the way that yeah. they might have been. Um, yeah. Should we end just really quickly on something that we might like? We've got a lot coming up on the slate. Is there anything specifically that you'd want to call out as something to look forward to? Hopefully, in, in a COVID world where comedy might be a cathartic release. Uh, yeah, well. Uh, Oh, it's hard. It's hard. Like it's I say, Ma Ma Mandy coming up at, at like really highly, really highly recommend. There's a new sitcom that Lee Maxson called Semi Detached that's going to be on BBC Two. That uh, it'll be interesting. I think it'll be one of those things that might split opinion a little bit because it's a real uh, sort of like a farce. It's a real kind of comedy of plot and it's quite extreme. It's upset. It's like the, the episodes are told in real time, and there's incredibly audacious, energetic form of storytelling in it where like anything that can possibly conceivably go wrong sort of goes wrong in this once a half an hour glimpse into the character's life so i think it's really bold i think and and i think that's the thing we talk about sort of risky and daring and and, and often we take that to means a tonal thing like like that it's extreme that it's got a lot of bad language or something like and that that's riskiness and and i think often just being counterintuitive and that's like a really mainstream show but it's it's got a very kind of bold uh storytelling dynamic at its heart and that's like a risky thing and a bold thing to do you know and like doing that sort of innovation in the mainstream can be a lot harder than yeah. sort of doing it you know and like a, a, a port of cabin and the edinburgh festival you know yeah 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 um i think that's it there's one question here that says any more inside number nine can you do a yes or no to yeah, that yes yeah, yes definitely right. yeah yes. cool i think that's finished on that thank you so much gregor so much no wisdom <laughs> thank you <laughs> Gregor and Emily, on behalf of Screen Skills and, and the audience, just a, a massive thank you. That was fantastic. Lots of great insight and advice there. So thanks so much for giving up your time. Um, I'm sure everyone, everyone really enjoyed it as well. No worries. Not at all. Yeah, thank you. Thank us. you. Brilliant. Well, that's it. That, thanks, everyone. Bye.